Hello and welcome to today's City Club Forum. My name is Ralph Delarada and it's my pleasure to serve as the president of the City Club of Cleveland this year. The City Club of Cleveland was established in October of 1912 and the City Club has served as one of the nation's premier public podiums for civic dialogue covering the most pressing topics of our time since our establishment almost 100 years ago. Our guest speakers rich in experience and knowledge, are here to spur discussion and learning amongst the citizens of Cleveland as well as our national audience. Our speaker today, Mohsen Hamid, is an internationally renowned author. Mr. Hamid is the author of two award-winning books in addition to other important works of literature. I took a moment to actually purchase one today. Look forward to reading it. He released his first novel, Moth Smoke, in 2000. Moth Smoke tells the story of an ex-banker and also a heroin addict in Lahore, Pakistan. The novel became a cult hit in Pakistan, where it was made into a television miniseries and then went on to be published in 10 languages. Moth Smoke beca became a New York Times notable book of 2000 and a winner of the Betty Trask Award. Amazingly, the book was even adapted into an operetta in Italy. Mohsen received, uh, released his second novel, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, in 2007. This novel recounts a Pakistani man's rejection of his high-class lifestyle in New York City. The Reluctant Fundamentalist has received critical acclaim across the world. It is now published in 20 languages and has won the An Anisfield Wolf Book Award and the South Bank Show Award for Literature, in addition to being shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize. The New York Times has also listed this novel as a notable book of the year and called it elegant and chilling. While the Washington Post wrote that Hamid has done something extraordinary. Mohsen Hamid was born in 1971 and grew up in Lahore, Pakistan. Although he spent part of his childhood in California, Mr. Hamid attended and received degrees from both Princeton University and from Harvard Law School. He went on to work in New York and London, first at McKinsey and Company, and later as a managing director of the branding firm Wolf Olins. Mohsen then returned to his hometown of Lahore, Pakistan, as a freelance journalist and writer. He currently holds dual British and Pakistani nationality and lives in London with his wife, Zahra. His writing has appeared in Time, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Independent, The Washington Post, and The Paris Review, among many other publications. In his writing, Mohsen attempts to elucidate the complexities of the world, which are mirrored in the de depiction of his characters and the method by which he tells his stories. There is simply no good or bad, and it is wrong to oversimplify. In this framework, Mr. Hamid Hamid definitely introduces the East versus West theme and blends politics with the personal. And while readers might not agree with the characters, they are sympathetic and are forced to understand them by most in sharp yet graceful prose. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to introduce such a fascinating and admired international literary figure. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Mohsen Hamid to the City Club. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be at the City Club. I think what I'd like to speak about today is actually less uh, my novels, uh, Maud Smirk and The Rutland Fundamentalist, and more um, actually about Pakistan and America and uh, the relationship between these two countries, uh, which is of personal importance to me because I've lived almost half my life in the United States and about half my life in Pakistan. So when people talk about uh, East versus West, I'm very keen for there to be a reconciliation because being half East and half West um, it makes life complicated for me when we don't think we can, we can get along. Uh, Pakistan appears increasingly in, in the news uh, in the United States and I think very little is actually known about the country. Um, I have friends who work for newspapers, you know, New York Times correspondent in Pakistan is a friend of mine. Um, and yet, when I see the headlines that come out, they almost always refer to the security situation. And because they refer to the security situation, um, they, they give a, a partial picture, I think, of what's going on there. 
and in fact making decisions based on, on partial knowledge can be dangerous. So um, it's a pleasure to come here and to give you my opinion of what's, uh, what's going on and perhaps what that means for the United States, uh, as well as to take your questions um, and have a conversation about what we think uh, that means. What's happening in Pakistan, uh, I should probably just start with very recent history. Uh, in, you're all, I'm sure, aware that uh, Pakistan was uh, made independent from India in 1947 when both countries separated from the uh, United Kingdom, uh, from Britain, and gained their independence, and has since been ruled by a series of uh, alternating dictatorships and democracies and has for much of that time been a U.S. ally. Pakistan was a member of, of CENTO and SEATO, the Central Treaty Organization and the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization, which were the Asiatic equivalents of NATO during the Cold War in the 50s and 60s. Um, and the U.S. Alliance, alliance soured after a war with India in 1971, during which Bangladesh became independent. Um, and remained, relations remained on ice until, until the 1980s when the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan threw America and Pakistan back into an alliance, which they, um, which they continued with under the dictator Zia haq and the American president Ronald Reagan in the 80s um, uh, until the Soviets left Afghanistan, at which point relations chilled again. Pakistan went through a period of democracy in the 1990s, but as is usual in, in Pakistan-American relations, when Pakistan was in this democratic phase, it was also subject to sanctions from the United States. Um, by coincidence, perhaps, in 1998, Pervez Musharraf seized power in Pakistan, and two or three years later, uh, September 11th took place, and suddenly America was confronted with the prospect of war in Afghanistan, and America and Pakistan were once again thrown together in alliance, and America once again lifted sanctions and began giving aid to Pakistan at a moment when Pakistan was once again a dictatorship. Uh, now things have changed, and so I'd like to speak a little bit about 2008 uh, and what's happening right now. In February, elections were held, and um, here uh, in the United States, to the extent that they were reported, um, most of the reporting dealt with the fact that the elections had uh, seen a devastating defeat for the political party supported by President Musharraf. What was less said was that fewer than 3% of the votes cast went to religious parties in the Pakistani elections. Um, so the two mainstream parties that won, the center-right party of Nawaz Sharif, the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz, and the center-left party of the Pakistan's People Party, um, which was run by the uh, widower of the assassinated former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, um, emerged with the largest number of seats in parliament. And that was significant, um, significant because what it showed us was if you do conduct a free and fair election in Pakistan, um, the number of people who sympathize with the religious parties of the far right is something like 2.2%. Um, and, uh, and that's enormously meaningful because I think very often the perception that comes out outside of Pakistan is here's a country where mass sympathy is with the Taliban or with some sort of, uh, you know, medieval concept of what the future of Islam and the world should look like. But democratic evidence, not just in 2008, but in every election in Pakistani history, suggests that religious parties receive something the low single digits of popular support throughout history. So the elections were encouraging, although they were discouraging, obviously, for um, uh, General Musharraf. Uh, the other thing which I'd like to talk about is, is the removal of President Musharraf, which took place just last month. And uh, that, was a, that was a remarkable moment uh, for a number of reasons, but it's probably worth just recapping how dictators have been removed in Pakistani history. Uh, the first dictator, uh, an ally of the United States, uh, named Ayub Khan, who governed in the 1960s, uh, left power, uh, gave power to his successor as army chief, another dictator named Yahya Khan, during riots over food prices and general uh, uh, disenchantment with his rule. Yahya Khan lost uh, a war in 1971, the war with India that resulted in the independence of Bangladesh. Uh, 